Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for appearing. I'd like to start with Mr. Uh, McIntyre. I really like looking at the reality situation. Who, in effect, pays the corporate in income tax? When corporations view the tax as a cost, just like in my business I view resident prices as a cost, who, in effect, pays that corporate tax? The shareholders, in my view. You, you don't think it's uh, the consumers of the product? Absolutely not. Mr. Hodge, what would you say? I can prove that to you if you want. There are many, many companies in this country that argue for replacing the corporate income tax with the tax on consumers. It seemed to me a waste of time if it was already a tax on consumers, so I, wouldn't, I can't understand why they would make the effort. Mr. Hodge, I'd like your thoughts on that. Uh, economists are pretty well agreed that there are three parties that pay the corporate income tax. Uh, it's either consumers through higher prices, shareholders through uh, lower uh, uh, share returns and, and lower share prices, and um, uh, w workers through lower wages. But what we're finding in, in a global economy is that workers uh, are paying the lion's share of the corporate income tax through lower wages and productivity. And so uh, we need to really understand this in a global context where cor capital is extremely mobile, but workers aren't, that uh, it's workers that are bearing that lion's share of the corporate tax. You know, oftentimes when I listen to these discussions, it, it's, it's like we have an option not to compete. I mean, the U.S. and w the U.S. as a country has to compete for global capital, correct? We, we don't have that option. We have to compete. So how do we compete when the CEO of, from in Intel says, in his decision-making factor, in order to produce or, or build a, a semiconductor plant, it costs $4 billion in Asia and $5 billion in the U.S.? And he largely attributes that to tax regimen. Good. I'm, I'm sure regulations play a part in that. If you're, if you're a corporate manager, let's say from a different country, if you're looking at investment decisions, why would you spend an extra billion dollars to invest in the U.S.? Well, there's no doubt that uh, some companies have advantages in low wages or that they uh, provide other benefits that make it cheaper to do things abroad, and there's not too much we can do about that. Uh, my point is that we probably shouldn't be paying our companies to go there. So if there's a tax advantage in China, I'll take your word for it, uh, we could solve that problem by getting rid of deferral so that the Chinese profits would be taxed at the same rate as if those profits were earned in the United States. So yes, if, it, if that's a problem, my solution solves it. Mr. Hodge. Uh, the corporate tax rate in China is 25 percent. Uh, which is just slightly below the average of the major industrialized countries. It's 15 percentage points lower than the federal corporate tax rate. Uh, so by definition, it is a much more competitive place, a cheaper, at least from a tax perspective, place to do business. And um, by ending deferral, as, as Bob has suggested, you would instantly make um, U.S. companies less competitive while doing business there and give it a distinct advantage to German firms, Swiss firms, French firms, every other firms that are doing business there. We want U.S. companies to do business in China. Uh, we want them to succeed in the global marketplace. And by hamstringing them, by eliminating deferral, or keeping the U.S. tax rate where it is, we are making the U.S. less competitive, we're making U.S. companies less uh, competitive, and ultimately we're making U.S. workers less competitive. And uh, uh, that is, is, is a recipe for slow economic growth. Isn't it also true that when a U.S. company invests overseas, that also uh, provides an awful lot of jobs in the U.S. supplying and servicing those overseas uh, operations? Yes, the, the research of, of uh, Matt Slaughter from uh, Dartmouth University has shown that uh, uh, it's what, what's, what they call in the military the tooth-to-tail ratio, and that is you certain, need a certain number of people back home to service those people who are on the front lines. And it's that way in corporate America, too. So if we're doing business in China, uh, we need uh, researchers and, and um, uh, designers and computer experts and financial people and all of these people back here uh, who do a lot of the brain work to support that work that's going on overseas. And so for, for, uh, as we're growing abroad, uh, U.S. companies are also growing domestically, and uh, uh, Mr. Slaughter has shown that uh, pretty convincingly in his economic research. I mean, overall, uh, the U.S. economy has never really generated much more than about 18.8 percent of GDP in terms of revenue. And you know, well, Professor Hauser calls that Hauser's Law. 
I, I'd like you to speak to that basic fact. I mean, as much as we would like, like to believe we could raise 21 percent GDP in revenue by a different tax regimen, how, how realistic is that to actually occur? Well, we've done it before. In fact, the only times we've ever balanced the budget in the last 50 years are when we did it. So there's, a, there's a, in, in in the 2012 budget, President Obama's budget. There's only three years where we actually collected revenue greater than 20 percent of GDP. Right. I'm only, saying only the last time we balanced the budget was in the Clinton uh, administration, when revenues went up to almost 21 percent of the GDP. And that uh, back in the 60s, we balanced the budget briefly when it was about 20 percent of the GDP. All the other years. In between those balanced budgets in Clinton and Johnson, different Johnson, uh, were places where we had lower revenues and unbalanced budgets. But don't you acknowledge the fact that taxpayers simply can't reorganize their affairs quickly enough when you increase tax rates? It just takes a little while. I mean, you, you, are, you are able to snare a higher percentage of GDP when you increase taxes, but eventually that, that benefit falls off. Uh, no, I don't think that's true. And I think what happened, and it's very clear what happened to the corporate income tax, is that members of Congress are uh, either cajoled or threatened by the corporate lobbyists uh, to give them back their loopholes. And then every once in a while, we have to clean up the tax code again. It used to be on a 15-year cycle. We missed out on the 2001 one due to uh, an ele a difficult election decision. But we are overdue to clean it up again. And yeah, it's, it's kind of like the Medicare rules with the doctors. If you don't change them often enough, they'll understand them. Well, first, I'm totally supportive of slimlining this tax code. It's absurd. Yeah. 70,000 pages. And I'm not talking about that. raising tax rates. You know, I'm talking about probably cutting tax rates a bit to, to make it more palatable. But all these subsidies we have in the code, don't we believe in free markets at all anymore? Uh, and, gee willikers, the companies come in with the same story, and you guys fall for it every time. The 2004 American Jobs Creation Act. They came in and said, look what's going to happen when you give us this thing. General Electric said, give us all this stuff. They wrote half the bill. And we will create jobs in the United States. What did they do since then? 32,000 fewer jobs at GE in America, and jobs are up overseas. So, yeah, I mean, you can fall for it or not, but... Oh, no, I, I don't, you, you have no argument with me in Good. special tax breaks. I appreciate that, Senator.